Very good. I see Mr. Smith and Mr. Ellis are in the virtual courtroom. Mr. Smith, you may proceed. Good afternoon. May it please the court. My name is David Smith. I'm here on behalf of the appellant, Alexander Rogopoulos. Uh, through this appeal, we're asking this court to reverse the non-final order that was uh, put in place denying class certification. The basis that the court used to deny the class certification was it, it didn't think that our client established commonality, predominancy, and numerosity. Um, the trial court based its determination on all three of those elements on what we believe to be uh, an erroneous understanding of real property law. Now, to the court's uh, <laughs> to the court's credit, I guess, it, there's no real clear definitive authority on the underlying question in this appeal. And that question is, do lot owners of a subsequently subdivided dominant estate have to each preserve their own easement rights or can easement rights of a subsequently subdivided dominant estate preserve easement rights to the entire estate by actions of individuals with rights? The, we, of course, are asking the court to answer that question in the affirmative, the second question in the affirmative. The trial court answered the first question in the affirmative. The challenge for the trial court was that there isn't clear case law on this point, as I just mentioned, but there is significant persuasive authority from other jurisdictions. There's also, by reviewing the document itself, a clear understanding of what the parties intended. And then also if the court reviews the statutory construction, um, specifically of the MRTA, there's a very clear understanding of what the legislature is wanting to accomplish in these kinds of situations. Going to the, the class itself, standard, Mr. Smith, can you help me out with, you know, just putting that, just table that for a second, it's, it's an interesting issue, but at the end of the day, I think we're talking about 51 individuals who may have an interest in this, um, many of whom are married. They all live uh, on one of three cul-de-sacs that by my rough estimate from a survey are about a thousand feet apart. Why doesn't this just fail on numerosity? Yeah, sure, that was uh, of course one of the issues that the court was concerned about. And we believe the court, what the court did erroneously was- I should, I should rephrase my question. Sure. Why was it an abuse of discretion yes, for this of trial judge to hold that, you know what, this, this is not an appropriate number um, or disparity or dispersion of, of separate claims and individuals to, to maintain a class? Absolutely. So the, the, the trial court abused its discretion in our perspective in that the first thing he did was he limited the class size to 31. He took all people... Now, Understand we pled two different classes, an owner's class and also a global class. Yeah. He took both of those and he says, okay, the class size is 31. And that fits within the Terry gray area factors. And he went through those factors saying, there's really, you know, it's, it's less than 50. I need to look at these other factors. And those factors of course have to do with, are they all closed geographically? Yes, they are. Can they afford the litigation? Well, perhaps there was no evidence. They're, they're not just close geographically. I mean, literally the farthest apart we're talking about is a thousand feet. You yeah. could not get a more compact class unless you were talking about a condominium building. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a, well, I mean, the lots aren't, aren't super small. It's a, it's a subdivision, right? I mean, it's a very typical Florida, uh, you know, planned uh, subdivision. Yeah. The, the factor that really comes into play. And the reason that we believe it within those Terry factors, if that's where uh, you're going, Your Honor, is that this case, it's impractical for the court to try to ask everyone that has an interest in property, 51 or 49, whatever the ownership was at the time. But then also you have to look at people who are potential licensees and tenants. Well, put, because yeah, put that aside for a second. Why is it impracticable to have these people either intervene or be joined, because either as co-plaintiffs or as co-defendants. Yeah, because you're talking about, say 51, you're talking about 51 plaintiffs. All of their cases, all of their facts and all of their you know claims or defenses are gonna be identical. So what we're saying- yeah, I'm not is, sure that, and that, that go, well, that goes to the commonality. I'm not, I'm not sure that's correct either. I mean, you, that, that's the, that is the, the inherent nature of land and boundaries and easements, which, is, which may be why you're struggling to find case law on this, is because 
all land and lots are inherently unique. When you took this dominant estate, what was once one became 31 separate tracts. Yes, they all, they all flow from title of dominant estate that was once served by a single easement, but now they are each considered unique. That is settled law. So each, eas so each easement's use and burden is going to be subject to unique facts. There may be some folks on one cul-de-sac who have absolutely no issue with this whatsoever, have no use for this easement and are not burdened by the fact that it's allowed to been overgrown, that you've got dogs guarding it uh, and that you know there's been fences. Brought. And then there may be one who says, yeah, I, I, would, I would use this throughway all the time if I could. Um, help me out with that because that, that is just inherent in having unique lots of land. Yeah, no question. And, and we're, we're surely not asking the court to adopt a standard that, that is anything but that. Every, every piece of land in the subdivision, of course, is unique. But what, what we've got here is a situation where the estate, the dominant estate was created and encompasses still all of those lots, irregardless of whether the lot's subdivided 31 times or once again, you know, 62 times. The dominant estate is still the dominant estate. What did not happen was the easement being created into 31 easements. That didn't happen. I think you're correct insofar as that goes, but the dominant estate, such as it was as a as a unique parcel of land, no longer exists. It's been it's been subdivided. It's gone. Yes, the, the easement flowed to that original to that original dominant estate, but now what was one is now 31, and it has to be analyzed and understood through the through the lens and through the the the, the vision of each of those 31 lots. The, the, the problem with, with doing that, Your Honor, is if we create a precedent where we say, okay, we have an easement, a dominant estate, mm -hmm. we're going to chop it up. Now we've got 31 new easements. Are those express easements or are they now implied? Are, are, are we creating, we, we didn't chop up that document. Right, we didn't rewrite that original grant. Oh, well, to some degree, this is this is a failure on the part of whoever did the subdividing, right? Because if if what if what the intent here is to make sure that easement runs right with each each and every one of those thirty one lots, there is a way to accomplish that. Yeah, of course. Right? Oh, and that didn't happen here. Well, well, with understanding that within the MRTA, they have two options to preserve the easement. One being they could have drafted that easement into each deed and preserve the easement through the minimums of title. Or preservation can be done under 712035 that simply preserves that easement by use. Now, use preserves the easement to everyone, to the dominant estate in and of itself. I, so yes. I mean, that's, that's where you're losing me. And then it's kind of the fulcrum the fulcrum of the argument that, that I'm having a hard time with is it cannot possibly be the law that lot 31's use of an easement is coextensive and co-equal to lot one's use of the easement. It is not one for all and all for one when you're talking about separate lots using a, a singular easement. I, there's no court that has ever held that. Well, courts have clearly held that an easement appurtenant exists for the benefit of the dominant estate. Of course, and, and the near subdivision does not extinguish the easement. No no right. argument there. Right, and it, but that also does not, the appurtenant easement, appurtenant easement does not exist alone for any particular part of that dominant estate. So if the court's gonna take the position that we're gonna chop it up and create 31 new easements, that's not what the law is. The law does not say that that easement exists only for lot 31. That easement exists for that dominant estate and that dominant estate remains a dominant estate. There's, the legislature obviously looked at this when they drafted 71203 and they said, okay, two points. One, if we're gonna allow people to preserve easements under subsection one, 71203 subsection one, they said a single recorded transaction will allow that easement to continue. A single recorded transaction, one. Not every lot has to have that recorded transaction in its minimum of title, only one. They also said, and they took that same philosophy into 712035 and where they got into saying, where we've already talked about this incredibly broad protection of use, they said use of any part 
grants right to the entire use. So the legislature looked at this and they said, well, wait a minute, we need to give really broad protection to these easements. And it's so broad that they're allowing a single recorded title transaction to preserve it and a single use. The legislature could have clearly come in and said, you know, we see this problem a lot. Land development is gonna create subdivided estates. We need to make these protections very specific. Maybe we should have added in language that said something to the effect that every subdivided lot needs to have a recorded title transaction or use of every owner who wants to preserve their rights must use it to preserve it. But they didn't. They specifically excluded that type of language. And that's the only perception that we can take from that statute is they were looking for broad protections, not isolating lot by lot protections and, and requiring very, very strict requirements of preservation. I, I, I understand your substantive argument, Mr. Smith. Can you can you help me out though that why can't why can't this be litigated on an on an individuated lot owner basis? Why can't they just be brought in as parties, joined joined against their will or or freely intervene if they want? Because it's 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 not a good use of the court's judicial labor and resources, and it's impractical. You're, you're asking the court to conduct 51 trials? Are we going to have 51 lawsuits on the same, the same facts? That's it doesn't make any sense. 51 people decide they want to participate. Well, yeah, I mean, of course, there's always going to be, you know, and, I, and look, I, I, surely I'm not going to sit here and say 51 people are going to join. I, you know, who knows? Some indication that a number of people have no interest in pursuing this. Isn't that correct? Well, so there was some hearsay documents, uh, you know, that were in the record from prior meetings of the board of directors. And if you wanted to read into that information, people were confused about the, their rights. They were confused about their obligations. And what you can take from it is simple confusion and understandably, right? I mean, this, this is not something that there's clear case law on. So they couldn't have had advice of attorneys from prior instances going, yes, it's very clear subdivided lots create these rights or don't create these rights. So there's confusion. Uh, whether or not 50 people want to join, you know, I have no idea. But it only makes sense to allow Regopolis to move forward in a class action so that all of these issues can be resolved in one proceeding. Why, why would we force 50 people to bring claims and pay for claims when, it, when they're all common, they all arise from the single act of the defendant impeding an, an easement? It affects everybody the same. Whether or not they elect to use the easement is irrelevant. Whether or not they ever touch foot on it is irrelevant. It, you know, the, the amount of times people use it or don't use it only comes into play when you're talking about nuisance damages. It's a higher nuisance damage for somebody that uses it all the time. It's a lower nuisance damage if I only use it once every 30 years. So the use is, you know, as long as it's used at one point in time within the 30 years, the right, the legislature wants that right to exist for the entire easement for the entire amount of time. I mean, that's, that's what the legislature is intending. It, it can't be read in any other way. They're, they were very clear. They wanted extremely, extremely broad protections for these easements. So the other issues, talking about commonality, <clears throat> the trial court, you know, it, it had issue with adverse possession and it had issue with the language in the easement that talked about the payment of taxes. So there is very a one sentence in the grant of easement that says, taxes on said easement to be equally borne by party of the first part, party of the second part. That's it, that's the only language in their easement about taxes. The court took the perception and stated that language creates a perpetual obligation for all lot owners to contribute to the taxes on the property as a condition for using the easement. And then the court went on to explain, this would allow the court to have to make additional individual lot specific findings. Well, again, the, courts, the court was taking this individual lot by lot approach. There's nothing in that grant of easement that says anything about one, payments of property taxes were perpetual, or two, that payment of property taxes were a condition of use. That language was a creation by the trial court in going beyond the plain meaning of the, the grant of easement. How do, you, how do you interpret taxes in that in this regard? Well, it's, 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 to me, it's a very plain and simple reading. It says taxes on said easement to be equally borne. On the face of the easement, there's a stamp tax. Yeah. 
So when when are doc stamp taxes typically paid in the course of a, of a real estate transaction before or after the recording of a deed? Well, right, right. They sign it, they take it down and they pay the tax. Right. So why on earth would a provision about taxes that had already been paid as part of the recording of a deed be included as a separate provision of the deed? No, no. They signed the document yes. and they said, hey, let's agree to pay the taxes. We'll go down and pay the taxes. And they did. But but the the document that you're referring to is the easement itself, correct? Which was also recorded. Right. That's what I'm saying. You don't typically you don't do a closing statement on the on the recorded deed is basically what you're saying. This is a line item of a closing statement in the course of a, of a real estate transaction. And for whatever reason, they put it on the deed itself. I've, I've never heard of that being done. It seems more likely that given, I'll, I'll accept for a moment that maybe taxes could be construed in, in, in a couple of different ways. Your reading seems though that, well, they were just talking about the recording doc stamp tax, doesn't seem very likely given the fact that where this arises is the actual deed that is being recorded. You wouldn't bother putting it in there. You would just, you just pay it, you'd apportion it evenly. And if one side doesn't pay it, you don't record it. Well, it, well no, I, think, I think it goes the other way, right? You're sitting there and you're talking with the person saying, let's craft this thing out. What, who's going to pay the taxes? And they went, oh, geez, we didn't address this. That's handwritten in, right? I mean, it's, this wasn't form language in the yeah. document. So they go, okay, we'll split it. They sign it, they go down and they pay it. Either way, even if the court does not adopt that reasoning, which, you know, it's the de novo standard, right? The court, this court will look at it however, however it wants to interpret it. I appreciate that, that argument, but I don't think that's going to be a winning argument for this. What? You have three minutes left. Do you wish to reserve any time for a bell? Uh, five minutes, please. Um, well, you've got three minutes left, so I'll reserve. Oh, three minutes then, yes, thank you. Mr. Ellis? Mr. Ellis, uh, turn your microphone mm -hmm. off and on again because we're not hearing you. Can't hear you, Mr. Ellis. Mm -mm. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Sorry about that. No problem. No problem. Uh, yes. Good afternoon, Your Honors. My name is Bradley Ellis of the law firm of Icard Merrill. I'm here on behalf of the appellee, Dr. Averett. Um, we are asked, uh, may it please the court? You go ahead and proceed. Thank you. Uh, we are asking the court to affirm the circuit court's order denying class certification. Uh, a little roadmap of what I'd like to speak to is, um, first of all, on the numerosity requirement, because I believe that is <clears throat> on its own dispositive of the class action procedure that's being attempted. Um, but beyond that, then I would like to speak to what I'm calling the no bootstrapping of equities. Um, and then the, also the other substantive issue of the joint and several tax uh, contract obligation. And I would ask the court that even if it were inclined to just PCA and deny based on numerosity or some other factor, it would still be very helpful to the um, litigants and to the trial court below if the, this court were to issue a substantive opinion on the no bootstrapping and perhaps even the taxes issue because that will become the law of the case and I do think we'll very efficiently streamline um, where this case goes from here. <clears throat> On the numera numerosity issue, um, again, we're talking- In terms of writing an opinion on this, is it strictly necessary if the only real question we have to answer is whether or not the trial court got it right that class status is not appropriate, simply looking at the number of potential class members? If the court were only to stop at that element, then no, it's not strictly necessary. However, these substantive issues do directly also fall into the commonality and predominancy factors. So the court could potentially also opine on those substantive issues under the class action analysis. And then that would still become substantive law of the case that would greatly assist the litigants in the trial court. If this court were inclined to only stop at factor A and say we're done, then, then obviously the court wouldn't go further. But the court could rightly, I think, opine on those substantive issues under commonality and predominancy under the posturing that we're here to uh, before the court today. Um, on the numerosity, we have 49 current owners. Uh, there's not a single case in Florida that's ever certified a class that small. The closest we come is the Terry L. Brown. 
Mr. Ellis, we just lost your uh, sound again. Can you all hear me now? Yes. All right, I, I switched microphones. <laughs> um, I think I was talking about the Terry L. Brown case. Um, that's the closest we've come to a class approximately this size. It denied class certification of 25 to 31 individuals and also then repeated the, the gray area factors that some federal courts use. This court has cited the Terry five times, but never, never analyzed the gray area factors itself or even specifically said, we also apply the gray area factors. Um, so this would be another opportunity for this court to do so. Um, but the circuit court did follow the Terry factors, applied it. Um, there is no abuse of discretion in the factual determinations that the circuit court applied in, in providing and analyzing those gray area factors. Um, and, and interestingly enough, the Ansari versus New York University case that Terry cites and also Mr. Smith cited, if you read in, in pages 114 to 116, that court's analysis and walking through the gray area factors, you could literally just transpose, you know, Regopolis for that, for that analysis. And it tracks very instructively for why this court should just deny certification of this class um, based on those factors. <clears throat> the only other case in Florida that also approximates a class of this size, it's actually a property law case it's the Costin v. Hargraves case, first TCA from 1973. And there, the class tried to certify um, an amorphous 531 class. And the court said, no, your real class is 27 people. And that, that's not enough. Um, those are the only two cases uh, in Florida that even roughly approximate a class of this size. Both of them mitigate against certifying numerosity here. Um, and then additionally, uh, the circuit court applying the gray area factors found numerosity um, is not found here. And on that basis alone, uh, the circuit court properly denied class certification. Um, I do want to speak to the, the no bootstrapping issue and um, to tag off of Judge Lucas's comments. Uh, this, is, this is basic real property law in Florida. Once the dominant state was, was carved up, however you carve it up, those individual remaining properties, their futures rise and fall on their own individual equities. You do not get to aggregate back to the, the pre-existing whole. Uh, you do not get to bootstrap on other properties. You do get to tack onto your predecessors for your property, but you do not get to bootstrap off of other properties. Um, so what is this case about? What this is about is Mr. Rajopoulos himself moves into the community, he lived there, he owned it for less than one year, lived there for a handful of months before filing this suit. Mr. Rajopoulos himself has never used the easement, doesn't know anybody else who ever did. Mr. Rajopoulos, if he's ever gonna get an easement for himself, needs to convince this court to allow him to bootstrap onto others. Um, and that's why I think it would be very helpful to still substantively opine on the no bootstrapping issue because even if class certification is denied, I have no doubt Mr. Adopoulos will find a handful of people to join him and they're gonna still press forward and saying, well, lot three over there used the easement. I get to, I get to keep the easement because they did too. And, and I still don't think that's appropriate and I don't think it's appropriate for uh, Dr. Ever to have to pay me to uh, litigate against that theory for a handful of years just to come back before you. So I would very much appreciate this court weighing in on the no bootstrapping. Um, I also want to point out that the fact that there's an association here <clears throat> and that there's a plaque is a non-issue. Um, this part, the dominant estate could have just as easily been carved out into any number of lots based on meets and bounds. This association provides no additional facts or law that, that are relevant to this question. The existence of the plat doesn't either. The plat, all that does is allow them to deed out these properties by reference to the plat as opposed to reference by meets and bounds. So the court really should look at this of, if this were carved up in the 31 completely unaffiliated lots, which they are for purposes of analysis, would they allow one family on this one acre and their use and their, you know, whether or not there was a gate with a lock and, and Dr. Everett gave them a key and they continue to use it, but he continued to keep everyone else out. 
without a narrative the benefit of everybody else? Well, clearly not. And the fact that there's a plat and the fact that there's an association doesn't, doesn't change that analysis at all. Um, I also wanna point out that the closest the law provides to us on this area of law is the Stackman v. Pope case. That's the 28th, 7th, 3rd, uh, 131. Uh, it's a 5th DCA 2010 case. Now that dealt with people trying to bootstrap properties together to try to claim a boat ramp on someone else's property, <clears throat> but it, it, it was the law of prescription. So they needed to, for 20 years, show actual use. And what they did is they, they, they found together 14 different people that said, well, I've used it this period, I've used it this period, I've used it this period. And Stackman said, no, the law of prescription, you can tack on your predecessors, but you cannot bootstrap on others. So you, you can only create a prescriptive easement by your own actions or your predecessors. And I think that's very instructive for the substantive issues of this case, because um, for the murder analysis for use for murder, the Jackson Bill v. Horn case, which was approved by the um, Clipper Bay case, says for use under murder, we follow the law of prescription. And so that would tack right into Stackman and say, well, you can't, you can't aggregate, you can't bootstrap. Uh, separately, the law of adverse possession in Florida, um, if you read any case on adverse possession, it, tax on, it talks about the law of prescription and then says, but for Florida, if you're adverse possessing, there's a shorter window, uh, it's, it's seven years, but the equitable considerations are pretty much the same. And so if we have this body of law that says, well, you can't gain a private easement by prescription by bootstrapping, then why, why would the law ever allow someone to successfully defend against adverse possession because someone else took it upon themselves to preserve their rights? when you did nothing. Um, the, the law needs to be the same for both of these issues. And so I think, I think it's, you know, Stackman's already there and this court can draw a straight line to, um, from that case and say, yeah, this applies for murder, for murder use, and this applies for um, adverse possession. Um, and, and this is a, an example that I used with the trial court as well is, if any one of these lots ever took it upon themselves to record a notice of termination, for their lot. Clearly, that would only affect their lot. No one here would ever say, well, that notice of termination terminated it for all 31 lots. And, and in fact, the Illinois case that Mr. Smith cited to <clears throat> for persuasive authority, the Beloit case, that actually was the issue in that case. And the court said, no, this person waived their easement, but that doesn't apply to everyone else. Everyone else still potentially has an easement. And so, if I can't terminate for someone else, then, then why could I preserve it for someone else? And the answer is you can't. Because um, again, these lots are all separate properties. By the same token, um, if anyone in this community uh, happened to climb over two layers of wire fencing and slip some Scooby snacks to Dr. Everett's dogs and actually got to the water, that doesn't benefit anyone else in the community. They potentially preserve their easement, but but no one else has ever tried that. Um, I do want to point out, there's also a very scalability issue with Mr. Smith's uh, arguments with still looking at the pre-subdivided dominant estate. And that's, you know, here, it's a 1962 easement, small acreage, but I deal frequently with similar issues that stem back to TIF deeds from the state from the 1800s involving tens of thousands of acres. And if this court were to adopt or um, even bless a view that, that any one individual property owner stemming from a TIF deed or a timber easement, you know, somehow using that for 100 years for their property, that, that litigants and the courts would have to look at the other 10,000 acres, it just it purely doesn't scale up. And, and it can't because each lot that gets carved out becomes its own, um, its own property with its own equities. Um, specifically to, to murder itself, <clears throat> I talked about, you know, there's, there's a line in the statute that says um, any use of any portion thereof preserves the whole. That is talking about the physical aspects of the easement. If you use a mile of a road, then that gives sufficient notice to the, the property owner that there's something there that they need to look into. And so it preserves potentially the rest of the physical um, extension of the easement. That statute has never been held to say <clears throat> that any use by any property um, 
preserves it for every other property. It's never been held to say that. Um, and there is another way that they could have preserved this. They could have recorded a notice of preservation. If you go to 71206, the requirements for a notice of preservation is each claimant needs to serve and file a notice naming themselves and their property. And then the clerk indexes that like a deed at, to the people and to those properties. So the statute already says, if you're gonna use a notice aspect to preserve, this is an individual task. And so the statute already, already identifies that that part of preservation, it's an individual effort. And so there's, there's nothing in the statute that would indicate that, well, the use preservation is a communal effort. Um, so I just, I wanted to point that out. In terms of um, the taxes issue, I wanted to point out, you know, in addition to my arguments in the brief, um, that taxes is plural and there's no indication that they meant it to mean just the stamp tax, which would be a singular one-time tax. It is a plural tax, but if you look at the taxes language in the deed itself, and specifically, it describes the location of the easement. And then it says taxes on said easement. A stamp tax is a tax on the document itself, not the property, not the easement, not, not any other uh, rem of the transaction. It is a tax on the document itself. The language of this clearly describes the physical location and says taxes on that shall be equally borne. And so I would posture that there's not any reasonable reading of this because it's plural and because it specifically says taxes on the easement um, that would allow Mr. Uh, Smith's reading of this to survive the challenge. And, and I get it, they have to make that argument because as, as the record shows, Dr. Raver demanded payment and they threw it in his face for a decade. Um, they have to make this argument because if they don't, they all lose, whether it's a class action, whether it's 10, whether it's 49. They have to make this argument because it's the only thing they have to, to keep it alive. Um, lastly, I do wanna point out to the court the same argument I did make to the circuit court. And that's, if this were allowed to proceed as a class action, that inherently means that if the class representative proves their case for himself, Mr. Rodopoulos for Lot 21, that he necessarily proves the case for everyone else. In theory, there's a perfect case out there for one of these lots that's gonna get them all over the hill. And if, if that's allowed to happen as a class action, it'll, it'll improperly shift the burden of proof to Dr. Aver to on the murder use and on the adverse possession to go lot by lot and prove that none of these people, none of the other people used it and therefore are not allowed to bootstrap onto the other. And so if the class action proceeds, I do believe that would be an erroneous shifting of the burden. Um, and on that alone, you know, it's, this is not a superior format for resolving this case. But rest assured, if a class action proceeds, we're gonna have to go through that. So we are gonna have 49, we are guaranteeing 49 mini trials that are gonna occur. Whereas conversely, as some of you have noticed, um, there might not even be half the association even interested in, in litigating this case. Um, I think that's the majority of what I wanted to cover. I'm happy to answer any questions. Otherwise I would yield the rest of my time. Very good, thank you, Mr. Ellis. Mr. Smith, you have three minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. In regards to the issue of taxes, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Everett's already conceded in his brief that it's joint and several. He specifically states that they could have apportioned it amongst themselves, collectively paid the one half, or any of them could have satisfied the entire obligation. Well, that just goes against his entire argument. He says one person could pay, and it would satisfy the obligation for the entire dominant estate. So the point of regardless of how the court interprets that language, the argument's already been conceded. It's, there's commonality. One person can make the payment, it satisfies the obligation, even if the, the payment is made today and it pays for all the back taxes, yay, everybody wins. It's a common argument. And that's already been conceded. So regardless, I don't think there's any point of saying we have to make that argument. I think our argument is the correct interpretation, but even if it's not, and the court adopts Averitt's argument, he's already conceded the point. When it comes to numerosity, I think it's important for the court to review the manner decision. In that case, the, the appellate court adopted a case of 350 uh, residents and lot owners of a mobile home park. 
residents and lot owners. They didn't limit the class to the lot owners. They said people that live there in addition to the lot owners. Like we're saying here, we've got owners, we've also got tenants, we've also got licensees or potentially other people with interest in the property. It's manner is the decision that supports our numerosity requirement where the court went beyond this idea that it was strictly limited in a real property case to just the property owners. Now to get back to the point of why is this not the law? I mean, why, why is it not this situation where one person can preserve the right to the dominant state? I think the most important thing for the court to look at here, even if the court doesn't wanna step into that bound where no court has ever gone before and make a, de a declaration on this point, it needs to go no farther than the document itself. The document itself provides the support for what the people who drafted this intended. It says clear as day, it's a perpetual easement as an appurtenance to the land, granted unto the heirs and assigns. When they intended this thing to exist, they intended it to exist forever, to the dominant estate forever, regardless of what the people who own the dominant estate did with it forever. That's what they wanted. So even if this court doesn't wanna go that far and say, well, it's, this is the law in Florida, it doesn't even have to go there because that's what is in the document itself. And it was error for the court to look at that and say, I'm sorry, I'm ignoring that grant of easement and I'm just gonna chop this thing up and we're gonna butcher it and create, I don't know, 31 express new easements or maybe they're implied. Either way, something creates non-commonality. No, 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 no. The court abused its, its, its uh, discretion in that regard and in reaching beyond what the document states, and we believe that it was error for the court not to find commonality. And just very brief, I don't know how much time I have left, but I do wanna hit on the point that I agree with Mr. Ellis. We are looking for four things. In this case, of course, obviously we're looking for the order that would deny class certification be overturned. We're then looking for an order uh, from this court or a mandate from this court to direct the court to enter class certification in favor of our client. But then importantly, we are looking for the court to make a determination as to what the taxes language says and means so that it becomes the law of the case. Because I agree with Mr. Ellis. We can resolve this case probably between the two of us if we had a definitive ruling on that point, one way or the other. Um, and then we, you know, as the appellant would like the court to affirm that easement rights can be preserved to the entirety of a subsequently subdivided dominant state by someone with actions or who has rights to that easement. And sure. we think that's the proper application of the law. Mr. Yes. Smith, you're at the end of your time. Take 15 minutes to conclude. I'm sorry, 15 minutes, 15 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just finished. If you want to give me another 15 minutes, I'm more than happy to. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm all done.